Good morning. I got a big question for you. And with my broken elbow here, I'm using a clicker for the first time with my left hand, so this is going to be intriguing. My big question for you is, many years ago, your parents bought a large appliance. It was delivered to the home in a box. Your parents were all excited about the appliance. They gave you, because you were five, six, seven, or eight years old, the box before it got thrown away. I want you to start with the conversation at your table. What did you do with that box? Just have a conversation. What did you do with the box? OK. So what did you do? What did you turn it into? How many forts? How many sleds? What would you slide down? The stairs. The stairs. Who would you put in it? <laughs> Younger brother. Pets. The point is, this is your curiosity. You were given something everybody else would throw away. You turned it into something. I know even people have turned them into tents and slept under them. Mattresses used to come in box, and we used to fold them into tents and then sleep under them for weeks. And However, what intrigues me is that, look what they say up at Harvard. The creative individual weds the most advanced understanding with the curiosity that characterized their life as that wonder-filled child. So that curiosity you had at five, six, seven, and eight, when you were given something everybody else was going to throw away, is the spark a lot of times for your curiosity. Because what happens when we become an adult, we go when we, we no longer is the box our friend, the box becomes our enemy. We go, we have to learn how to think outside of the box because the box has constraints. And in my world, just as, as you mentioned, I love constraints because as I interview people that have come up with ideas, usually when they're given a big budget or all the time in the world, they don't come up with the idea. It's when you have the constraint. So I want to talk about constraints and how do we go and self-impose some constraints to try to go and spark our curiosity. Because curiosity, according to James Cameron, if you know James Cameron, Avatar fame, uh, Titanic fame, James Cameron said, curiosity is the most powerful thing you own. And so what is curiosity? I'm going to give you Albert Einstein's definition. Einstein said, if the average person is looking for a needle in a haystack, the average person would stop when they found the needle. The curious person would look for everything in a haystack that can act like a needle. And you go, whoa, how do I apply that? Well, I'm going to give you my example. Every time I teach, I wear cufflinks. It's the only time during my life I wear cufflinks because I want my teaching moments to be memorable. And I love the feeling of putting on cufflinks and then going and giving a talk. And last year in Atlanta, I'm getting dressed in a hotel to go give a talk downstairs. And I realized I had forgotten my cufflinks. Now, I could go down and roll up my sleeves. But that's not good enough. That's not curious. So my challenge, like Einstein, was, so what's a cufflink? What in this room could act like a cufflink? So tell me 10 things that you could borrow from a hotel room that could act like a cufflink. That's curiosity. Go. Paperclip. Stapler. Oh, I'm sorry? Safety pin. Rubber band. Dental floss. Sewing kit. What was that? Stapler. Paper. Shower cap. Like it. Shower curtain rings. I want to know, I want to let you know what I did. I noticed that the dresser drawer knobs could be screwed off. So I unscrewed the dresser drawer knobs with my credit card. 
I put the dresser drawer knobs on, screwed them on the other side, went down, gave my talk, and my client came running up after the talk. He said, we're all having a conversation. Those are the largest cufflinks we've ever seen. <laughs> and I told him the story, and he says, wow, what a lesson. And that, this is the chief executive officer of, of Simmons Mattress to make beauty rest. And he says, every day when we have resource constraints at Simmons, someone said, remember the dresser drawer knobs. You got to think differently. And so when you come home from a trip, say, and you open your refrigerator door, you don't have all the ingredients for a meal, you've got to be curious. You've got to go and adapt. And that's why I think curiosity is so key as a skill set for today. So what I want to go, there are several different types of curiosity. There's that unbridled curiosity, which is great. What I love is strategic curiosity. How do you ask the right questions? How do you go then and listen for possibilities? How do you innovate through collaboration? And most importantly, how do you take ownership of your brain and keep it alive so that you can constantly be coming up with ideas? So to start off with, I got to benchmark you. I teach three populations. Main population is my MBA students at University of Virginia. Secondary population, adults. My favorite population, Odyssey of the Mind and Destination Imagination, fourth graders. So I'm going to give you an exercise that you, you had when you were in fifth grade. It is in the back. It is in all arithmetic books, still in print today. And you might have had this before, but the answer is different today. There's my challenge to you. And the quiz question is, how many squares are there in that little diagram? So I want you to look at that diagram and just by yourself, I just want you to do this by yourself, is to calculate how many squares do you see? And I'm going to put on a little music, and when the music is over, I want you to write down someplace how many squares you saw. And when you see one right answer, look for a second right answer. That's being curious. And when you see a second right answer, look for a third right answer. OK. Now I'm going to break the rules. I want you, you've written down, write down your answer so that you'll commit to it. How many squares do you see? OK, now I'm going to break the rules. I want you to share how many squares you saw with everyone else at your table. And your goal is at your table to come up with more squares than anyone individually saw. Go. OK. How many squares are there? 34. 64. Millions. You, 
You know what the right answer in the back of the fifth grade arithmetic book, still in print today? 16. I wrote to the publisher. You know what they said? You're not supposed to learn that there's more until 10th grade. Okay? In 10th grade, you learn the formula for this. And the formula is the sum of 4 squared plus 3 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared, which would equal 30. So if you, think, if you got 30, you could then patent yourself, yeah, I got the right answer according to the formula. So I, of course, I put this exercise in my book. And the reason why it's now, what a great idea, 2.0, is because I got challenged two years ago by a nine-year-old who said, Mr. Thompson, 30 is only correct on paper. I said, OK. He says, but you're using a PowerPoint presentation. And I said, yes. And he said, all the lines up there are composed of pixels, and pixels are square. <laughs> so I asked this nine-year-old child, how many pixels are there, and how do I see a pixel? And he said, magnify your screen by 400%, turn the line on an angle. Then I figured I would stump him. I said, son, so how many pixels are there? And he said, Mr. Thompson, what's the resolution of your monitor? <laughs> I go, I don't know. And then another kid said, what software do you have on your MacBook Air? And I go, I don't know. And he said, well, do you have 3D software on there? Then there's more. So the answer is 30 multiplied by 1048 by 12. 1,280 multiplied by now 3D, which would be the sum of 3 cubed plus 4 cubed. I don't know. <laughs> Millions, right? <laughs> Millions is the answer. But do you see how we went from there was one right answer, and then there's a formula which gives us the right answer, to now it's changing, it's changing, it's changing. So I'm going to give you Einstein's strategy for maintaining curiosity. Einstein challenged us to be passionately curious. And he said, always look for second right answers, and then third right answers, and then fourth right answers. Always look at your problem from a different perspective than it was handed to you. And I'll go into this in greater detail. But finally, which to me is the most important thing Einstein said, is every year look for a different answer. Don't just say 2014 is going to be Oh, that much different than 2013, so I can extrapolate. No. Think like the Tao Te Ching. You can never cross the same river because the water is different. 2014 is going to be so different than 2013. So we got to go and think like Einstein, who, when he taught second year physics, gave his students the same exam from first year physics. Dr. Einstein. Dr. Einstein did that for a purpose, because he told the students when they would raise their hand and say, Dr. Einstein, we already had this test. He said, I know, but that was last year. This is second year physics, and the answers are different. Challenge your brain to say the answers are different. So why are they different? Because ideas never have traveled in straight lines. They're not a manufacturing process. And what I want to demonstrate is ideas, what I believe, follow in a spiral fashion. And I just want to demonstrate this by consumer purchasing. For those of us that can think back 40 and 50 years, who came to our home to sell us stuff? Full of brush. Tupperware. Who was that one? Encyclopedia Britannica and World Book. They all came to our home. Even neighbors came to our home 40 and 50 years ago. But then mom goes to work, kids go to after school programs, and nobody comes to our home. We have to go to bricks and mortar to shop. But then we don't want to wait in line. So we create 7-Elevens and prompt medical cares. But then we want to buy in bulk, so we create Costco's and buy SUVs to fill up. But then internet comes along, and we get click and mortar. So you can buy something online, then pick it up at Bed Bath & Beyond. And the term for this was described in 1928 by the Austrian economist Dr. Joseph Schrumpeter, who calls this creative destruction. As we see things happening and new things being created, what 
really what you also have to look at is what's being destroyed. What industries, what, what, um, what ways of thinking are being broken to get to that next level. And so if you think that things go in the spiral, actually what they do is they go in opposites. To go from one end of a spiral to the other end of the spiral before you move up, you have to go through an opposite way of thinking. And that's how I like to teach people to be more curious, to learn to think in opposites. Think back for some of us. Do you remember a time when you didn't eat the meal, maybe you didn't like the meal that your parents created, so your parents said to you, go to your room, right? That was the ultimate punishment when I was a kid, go to your room. So think today. I don't like Brussels sprouts. So if I don't eat them, if my parents said to me, go to your room, I'd go, OK, because that's a multimedia experience. <laughs> the punishment was, if you don't eat your Brussels sprouts, you're going to have to sit here for 30 minutes and talk to us. That's the punishment. So the opposite, see how the room has changed. Well, let's say of another opposite. Let's create a MOOC. And we're going to create these massive open online courses, and we're thinking all these people are going to be going online by themselves and taking these courses. Well, all of a sudden, we're noticing something happening. We're noticing at Starbucks and Panera and at, at my university, people are getting conference rooms. And who are the people that are coming together? The people that are individually doing the MOOC. You go, whoa, wait a minute. They're going from individual to wanting to come together. So we're thinking, so opposite. So you're reading in the newspaper. What's the hot story for the last week? Can we work at home? Wait a minute, we were all talking about all the advantages of working at home. And then Marissa Mayer at Yahoo says, wait a minute, we got to build our Yahoo culture. Nope, can't work at home. And now people are going, well, you know, if you want to improve productivity, you can work at home. But if you want to improve innovation and collaboration, you got to come in the work. So it's not an either or, it's a yes and. There's advantages to both, but you've got to see both. What's the big one? Happening right now, we're having a discussion about let's raise the minimum wage to $9 an hour. Nancy Pelosi just said yesterday, let's raise it to $10 an hour. Being an entrepreneur, I'm going, you know, I bet you, okay, this is wild. Some people are going to hate me. I bet you could create more jobs by lowering the minimum wage. I don't know. I think it's a yes and. You got to look at both, have conversations about both. And that is why I say today we live in a world of paradox. And Dr. Jonas Salk said it so well. In a world of paradox, the question is the answer. The people that are going to hire us, because I think we need to become invaluable as candidates for a job. The people that are going to hire us, I believe, are going to be hiring us as much for the questions that we ask, even maybe even more for the questions that we ask, than for the answers that we can give that every other student in my class can give the same answer. And what is the greatest question you can ask? Why? And I learned that from a 93-year-old man 15 to 20 years ago. I was given a talk at General Motors, and the speaker after me came out like I want to come out when I'm 93. He came out with a woman under each arm, <laughs> and he was going to an overhead transparency machine, and his name was Dr. Deming. He designed continuous improvement, Kaizen, and the quality movement around the world, starting in Japan. And he said to the folks at General Motors, I only want to teach you one thing. When you see a problem, when you see a process delay, when you see a red flag, ask why is it occurring five times. Not once, not twice, but five times. You see a problem, why is that occurring? You get a response. Well, why is that occurring? You get a response. Well, why is that occurring? Only after you ask why five times do you get to the root cause of your challenge, Deming said. And I can't tell you how powerful asking why several times in a row has been to me in my career and my life, and it has actually saved my health. I'm a marathon runner. 
and an extreme athlete, or was, and, um, until the elbow. And uh, I keep going to my physician and keep complaining about all the pain, you know, the back pain and this pain, this pain. And my doctor would keep saying, well, I'll stop running. Uh, yeah, right. Just give me drugs. And I just kept saying. And, and so in my mid-50s, my back started fracturing. And they, they say, well, stop doing this and stop doing that and stop doing that. I go, well, why would that be happening? Because I'm an athlete and I eat well and all that. I kept asking, why, why? And then I started Googling about it. And I found out that thin Caucasian marathon runners that are lactose intolerant are developing osteoporosis. Because when you have a bad gut, you're put on a drug called prednisone. And every time my gut goes bad, they put me on prednisone. So I asked my doctor if I could get a bone density test. And my doctor of 20 years said I was a hypochondriac. No, you shouldn't have a bone density test. So I challenged it, got second opinion, got bone density test, and I have severe osteoporosis. I have the bone density of an 87-year-old man, and I am now on an uh, intravenous drug uh, called Reclast, and I'm building bone density 6% a year. But you know what they, my doctors say to me? Thank God that you analyzed it, because we would have never caught it. We don't think men get osteoporosis. And you go, Ask why. If your kid is not doing well in school and, you don't, and the teacher says, well, this is what we think is going on, go, why? And then you get a response out, why? Ask why five times. You'll be amazed how deep that will get. And it's also a form of curiosity. So I'm asking you to ask more questions. Now I've got to tell you the bad news. Well, maybe the good news to start with. We ask why 65 times per day, but only when we're five years old. <laughs> Look, we ask 65 questions per day at five, but by the time we become 44 and are in leadership around the world, we only ask six questions per day. And no longer are they why. They're what, when, and how much. And the number of questions you ask per day doesn't go up until you retire. And those questions are, where are my keys and why did I walk into this room? <laughs> Which adds no value to this world. It's, those questions are not going to create a patent. But asking why might. So what else follows this curve? The number of times you laugh. You laugh 113 times per day at five. And by the time you get into management, you only laugh 11 times. And the laughter doesn't go up until you have grandchildren. Well, let's see about your creativity. It's the same curve. Your creativity is at 98 percentile at 5, based on all the fluency exercises we use, do, and at 2 percentile at 44. So I've coined a term to describe what it's like being 44, and I'm sure some of you statistically are 44. Terminally serious. When we become 44, we become terminally serious because our laughter level is at its low, our creativity is at its low, and our question asking is at its lowest. So I've got a challenge for you. How many have a watch on? I want you to take your watch off of your arm and put it on your other arm, just for today. You might need help. Get the person next to you to help you out. It's going to feel weird. It's going to pull hair off of your arms. <laughs> but I've got a reason why I want you to do it. If you don't have a watch on I want you, and you're a guy, I want you to move your wallet from one cheek to the other or to the front. <laughs> if you don't have that, but you've got a cell phone, move it from one pocket to the other. And here is why I want you to do it. Because statistically, 6 to 11 times today, you're going to look to tell the time. And you're going to now look at your wrong arm. And you're going to call yourself an idiot. <laughs> so every time you look at your wrong arm, I want you to put the biggest smile on your face you can create. Because guess what a real smile creates? A real smile wrinkles at the eyes. 
a real smile sparks both hemispheres of the brain and will jumpstart your brain. And Dr. Paul Ekman, who I work with, Dr. Paul Ekman, to do a TV show on called Lie to Me. And Paul and I teach at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. And Paul Ekman said, if you want to stimulate your terminally serious audience, get them to smile with a real smile 10 times per day. So when you're feeling stuck, move your watch. When you're not having a good day, move your watch. When you go to the airport and the flight's delayed by two hours, move your watch. And you will be amazed how then when you start looking to tell the time and you put that smile on your face, how it will jumpstart your brain and how it will be spontaneous because when you start smiling, other people start smiling. It's amazing. I, I try this at cocktail parties or, or at uh, airports and people go, you just watch and all of a sudden I put on this smile, a real smile, not a Hollywood smile. <laughs> people just start smiling. So here are some more questions. What is the result I want to achieve? This is Stephen Covey's start with the end in mind question, but I'm going to add to it. Because start with the end in mind is only right brain. Because it's a visualization piece, which is your creative side of your brain. I want you to add the left brain component to that question. So after you say, what is the result I want to achieve, then be specific. Then I want you to say, why do we want to achieve this? And be passionate. Then you can go, how are we going to achieve it? And be bold. Most people, when they have a challenge, they go, how, how are we going to do this? What do we do here? I want you to start with what, then why, then how. And it's that iteration that will help you. And I believe you're going to be able to get a downloaded version of all these slides. So if you aren't able to take notes, you can, th th there is a downloaded version of these. Here is my favorite new question. I love shoes and running shoes. I love Zappos. Anybody here buy shoes from Zappos? You know, they got the greatest customer service going. So I called them up and said, how do you keep coming up with your cool customer service strategies? Because they'll stay as long as they want, I want on the telephone to make sure that I got the right pair of running shoes or what have you. And they said, we always say, what if we trusted our customer 100%? What would we offer them? So I got a challenge to you. What if we trusted our students 100%? What could we offer them in the curriculum? What if we trusted our colleagues 100%? What would we share? I think it's my favorite question. I'll have a new favorite question in a couple of months, but right now I go, if I trust 100%, what would I do different today? And I just recently gave a grand rounds at UVA Medical Center and I said to the doctors, if you could trust your patients you're going to see today 100%, how would that change your medical directives? And they go, whoa, yeah, it really would change this and this and this. I said, well then, what if we trusted them? And then also said, okay, now what do we have to do because some of them aren't going to be compliant. But don't just put up the barrier that I don't trust. What if we trusted 100%? My other favorite question is I love to look for blind spots. You know, you, you know, you got that blind spot in your car, but you also got that blind spot in life. And that blind spot in life is what I want to help you find because this is what has gotten me my jobs in my career because I've helped find blind spots for my prospective employer, which was Walt Disney, and for other people. Here's how I like to go and find blind spots. I always go, so what would I never do? Now, why would I go and what would I never do? Because then I look at the never and I flip it into reality. So I want to tell you a day, um, it's 1976. I'm at Disney, I'm helping build Epcot. Anybody know what EPCOT stands for? Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. It was Walt Disney's last dream. So I'm in my first brainstorm at Disney. I'm, the, um, um, I'm only like 23 years of age, 
and they tell me to sit in the back of the room because I'm brand new. Okay. So I'm sitting in the back of the room and they're talking about technology and how we, what kind of technology we're going to use at Epcot. And someone says, have you heard about Betamax? Because be Betamax, whoa, what's Betamax? And they started talking about it. It's this little box and it can record off of TV and it's videotape, but it's really high resolution. And I'm going, cool. And the president of Disney is there and he's going, no, no we can't talk about that. Didn't you know we're suing Sony? We don't want Betamax and videotape to come into the United States because we don't trust U.S. customers. If they got videotape, they would record the wonderful world of Disney off of TV and they would sell it to their neighbors. And I go, what? <laughs> I'm sitting in the back. And my boss goes, well, you know, that's, a, you know. And they sued Sony for two years. That's why JVC came on in. That's why Betamax didn't get the start we thought it was going to get. So I go, what would we never do? We would never embrace Betamax then. We would never start, whoa, what would I, I would never leave Disney, go to Sony, embrace it, and create my own healthcare company. And I started thinking about it, and I started seeing this market that Disney couldn't handle, and that's what I did. I quit. I teamed up with Sony. I started a cartoon healthcare company. And within seven years, we sold more healthcare programs for K through 12. It was all on Betamax and on VHS. And we were the largest healthcare company in the world. And I sold it to Encyclopedia Britannica. But my whole time, I had a dartboard with a picture of Mickey Mouse on it. <laughs> and I would constantly say, what would Mickey do? which is what we were supposed to say at Disney. What would Mickey do? And then I go, I'm doing the exact opposite. <laughs> Mickey would never do a program on genital herpes. No. <laughs> I did. Because it was pandemic in 1977, and Mickey would never do a program in 1981 on a new disease that didn't have a name, now called AIDS. I produced the first AIDS educational program in the world using Ryan White case in Kokomo, Indiana. Mick, Mickey would never do a program on steroid abuse, on cocaine abuse. All of our programs were what would Mickey never do? And I, so I love to use that tech. So what would I never do? I, at the end of every year, I make a list of the five things I would never do the next year. You know, like, we're all supposed to go, so what's my New Year's resolution? I make a list of, what are the five things I would never do? Take ballroom dancing lessons. Go to Gold's Gym and become a bodybuilder. I make all these lists, and then I pick the wildest never, and then I do it. And I just want to tell you, three years ago, I picked, go to Gold, Gold's Gym and become a bodybuilder. Because I've always been 125 pound, you know, weakling. You know, I, I can run fast. I'm a marathoner, but I would never would look good in Gold's Gym. I went to Gold's Gym, I've hired a trainer, and my workout partner was 365 pound UVA ex-football player. We are now on YouTube and all these things, and we are called the fly and the windshield. Because <laughs> when we chest butt, it looks like I'm getting squashed. But when I broke my elbow seven weeks ago, you know what the orthopedic surgeon said? The first thing he said when he looked at me, he goes, thank God you are muscular and you are in shape. Your re rehab is going to be so much easier. Thank you, Lord. How did I know going two years ago to Gold's Gym was going to help me with a broken elbow? But that's why, how you find that blind spot. So my challenge, where would you never, ever go on vacation? Make a list. What course would I never, ever take? Then, hmm, what would be right about that? So I want to show you how um, this works in the real world. 15 years ago, I got a call from Pepsi, and they needed a new drink. They had just created a soft drink that some of you might have tried. It was called Crystal Pepsi, and it was clear. And Pepsi thought, because they did blind taste tests, on a clear drink, which I go, makes no sense in the world. <laughs> but they did blind taste tests, and they thought we would like a clear Pepsi called Crystal Pepsi, and you hated it. 
So they called me up and they said, you got three days to create a new product. And I go, I can do that in five minutes. And they go, what do you mean? I go, well, I'm charging you the same amount, but <laughs> I'm, I said, I think in opposites. You created a clear drink, Pepsi, Pepsi, you know what the consumer wants? They want water. And Pepsi said, we will never sell water. Oh, okay, it's now called Aquafina, but 15 years ago they said they've never sold. So, okay, I gotta come up with a second right answer to go, oh, okay. So, I said, I want you, your next big drink is gonna be the exact opposite of that. It's gonna be darker than Pepsi. They go, there's nothing darker than Pepsi. I goes, yes, there is. What is? I said, coffee. What kind of coffee is darker than Pepsi? Espresso. So I said, there's a new coffee company thing that's hot now. It's called Starbucks. I want your next product to be a coffee drink co-branded with Starbucks. Um, I just want to show you in case you like it. It's called Frappuccino. Did you know that Frappuccino was a co-brand between Starbucks and, um, and Pepsi? And that's what we created 15 years ago. And I had to go to Bentonville, Arkansas to sell the idea to Walmart. And the purchasing agent said, Bubba doesn't want a coffee drink. <laughs> but see, I think in opposites. So I had a response. I said, Mrs. Bubba does. <laughs> the number one selling soft drink at Sam's Club in Walmart today is Frappuccino, and who is buying it but Mrs. Bubba? So my point is, think in opposites. Constantly think in opposites, and it will help you just break out. So when you go and say, what do we want to look like? What's our organization want to look like? What's our school want to look like? What's our course want to look like in five years? Also say, what will we never, ever look like five years from now? And you will be amazed. And then when you come up with what would we never look like five years from now, say, what's right about that? And challenge it, because it goes through that spiral. I'm trying to multitask here to hit my iPhone so I can see the time with my broken elbow. So if you see me moving slow. Okay, so how do you use this opposite in any brainstorm? Here's my favorite way to brainstorm. I start off with, what should we start doing? But then I like to say, what should we stop doing? What should we do different? And what should we keep on doing? Now, why would I do that four-way brainstorm? Because that's how Cirque du Soleil got reinvented. Cirque du Soleil was a little circus in Canada. And then they said, what should we start doing that nobody else is doing? Hmm, maybe add professional musicians to the circus. Maybe a symphony. What should we stop doing? Hey, maybe no animals. And by using this strategy on four walls of one room, Cirque du Soleil reinvented itself. What should we start doing? What should we stop? What should we do differently? What should we do more of the same? Okay, now I wanna show you what I mean by constraints. As I said, the four walls of a box, to me, are really important. I love constraints. But they have to be the right constraints. Dr. Deming taught me that all ideas have to be measurable. You gotta be able to measure it, cool. Also, I believe when we're creating something, it has to change behavior for the positive. Number three, it's gotta be affordable. And number four, it's gotta be pleasure versus pain. Anything that I ever create, I want to be pleasure. So one of the things I'm working on right now is because I, I, I have uh, react, reactive hypoglycemia. A lot of us ex-marathoners have it because we've carbo-loaded all of our life. So I have to stick my fingers a couple times a day and I go, that hurts. So I've been working on with the team a transdermal blood sugar monitor that doesn't hurt, that will download to my iPhone. So I wanna go and give you my favorite example <laughs> of these constraints. And some of the women, you're not gonna understand this, but all the guys here get this. You go walking into any urinal around the world, especially in airports, you're gonna walk out with sticky shoes. That's gross. 
That's really gross. So they tried to go and solve the problem the typical way, and they held a competition, and people started creating signs, and this is the sign that they put up, <laughs> which was, don't pee on the floor. <laughs> and they didn't ask the question, why? Why do guys pee on the floor? Because? They've got a cell phone in one hand and a briefcase in another hand, so they're going hands-free. And then also, they're talking to the person next to them, or they're just staring at a wall. But you know who came up with the idea? The person that kept asking why several times. And he says, guys are aimers. And if a guy doesn't have something to aim at, they don't care. So this guy happened to be a janitor in Stockholm, and he noticed if there were flies in the urinal, guys would aim at them. <laughs> so what he did was a brilliant solution, which is now sweeping the world. He bought plastic flies and glued them into his urinals. <laughs> it solved the problem. Because guys are so stupid, <laughs> they think the fly is real, it's not moving, and by the time they're done, they go, God, that's a plastic fly. <laughs> but I want to show you how this solution meets all of those four constraints. It's measurable, it changes your behavior, it's affordable, and it's pleasure versus pain. And Brazil just did us one better they turned the whole urinal experience into a soccer game. <laughs> you move the ball into the goal, and then you go, goal! <laughs> and then it flushes, and out comes the ball again for the next person. <laughs> so you see what I mean about you need constraints. So I've got some homework for you. You've, re you've seen the power of asking questions. You've seen the power of asking questions. So what do we do at our dining room table with our kids? How many of us say, when your kids come home from school, what did you learn today in school? And what is the typical response? <laughs> Nothing. So what if you change it to, what questions did you ask today? and change the conversation to what questions did you ask today in school, and then you tell about what questions you asked today at work. And I can't tell you the emails that I've gotten in regarding to that challenge. We start having a conversation. Because I believe if we don't ask questions, we don't learn. So I just want to go and just tell you in my in remaining five minutes, I am a I am a chemist. I did the science curriculum, but I'm a little bit different. I was told in my third year of uh, undergraduate school, University of Delaware, by my advisor, you will never get a job at DuPont, which is what I, why I went to University of Delaware, because we're guaranteed a job at DuPont if you're a chemistry major and graduated in 1970. And my advisor said to me, You'll never get a job at DuPont because DuPont now has a requirement that requires two years of German for any new hire because all research was in German at that time. And well, the reason why he told me that is because I'm severely dyslexic and not only did I fail first year German, but I failed English and history and even physical education. I don't know why, but <laughs> I, I'm an AF student. and. My advisor said, you know, Chick, uh, I just want to tell you, you know, you're not going to graduate. I'm still 1.9 to whatever, grade point average, so I couldn't be in a fraternity or anything. But he said, you know, you're never going to graduate, so why don't you just go and get whatever job you can. And so I got a job at Pepperidge Farm Bread. I was the raisin scraper on the second shift assembly line for making Pepperidge Farm raisin bread in Downingtown, Pennsylvania. And people would step on the raisins as they fell off the line on first shift, and I scraped them off the floor on second shift. And I was doing that for about three months. It was $3.66 an hour, which was pretty good at that time, with all the free raisin bread you wanted to eat. Um, 
And that allowed me to play tennis, which was my life's passion. And on the tennis court one day, I met a gentleman who had just left DuPont because he had come up with an idea. He had taken polytetrafluoroethylene and extruded it, but allowed air to pass through it. Hmm, that's interesting. And he started telling me about this after we played our round of tennis. Um, and um, he was telling me about that, and I said, well, that's really cool. You know, God, could you turn it into clothing or something? He goes, what? I said, yeah, no, you, this is a film, it's just, you know, it's Teflon, and if it's breathable, why don't you just put it under there for, you know, sweating? I said, I'm a hunter, and, you know, sweating, but, you know, also a runner. God, could you, and he goes, wait a minute, what do you do? And I go, I'm a raisin scraper. And he said, <laughs> I said, well, no, I'm a chemist, but a raisin scraper, but, you know, you ask my advisor, I'm, you know, I get an A in chemistry and in biochem and pchem and all of that, you know, I'm top of my class, but I failed everything else. And he said, do you like new products? And I said, yeah, I live new products. And he hired me. I became one of his first three chemists. And his name was Bill Gore. And Bill Gore had invented Gore-Tex. And I just want to tell you, in closing, what uh, my final, uh, uh, you know, how that went at Gore. Bill said, look, you're going to be different. I can tell you're different than the other people. You're, you're a sort of a, a catalyst. And he said, you know, you're sort of like a uh, creative guy. I go, okay, yeah. And he said, well, there's a new thing called brainstorming. So um, every Friday, would you run a brainstorm for our folks about what new uses could we come up with for Gore-Tex? No. Okay. So I did that for several Fridays. And this is 1970 or 69. And, um, but one, I wanted to give them an idea that I had come up with. And so here was my big idea. It came to me on a Wednesday night, two days before the brainstorm, at 11 o'clock, eating my third slice of pizza on my waterbed, and I was on my fourth beer. And the pepperoni slice dropped off of my pizza onto my sheets, and I go, oh my god, I'm going to have to wash my sheets now. Like, crap, I haven't washed them in three weeks. You know, I still got another week to go. <laughs> and then I go, whoa. If these were Gore-Tex sheets, I would never have to wash them again. I could just wipe them down with a little alcohol and they'd be, well, I can't, $500 sheet wouldn't work for a college student. Where would it work? Gosh, I had just been in the hospital with a hernia operation and it went really bad, so I had to be, you know, in there for a couple of days, but the guy, patient next to me was in a body cast and he was getting decubitoid ulcers, bed sores, and they kept saying, wish we had something he could lie on. Hmm. Gore-Tex hospital bed sheets for patients to prevent decubitoid ulcers. I went to Bill Gore. I said, I got this idea. Here was my curious boss. He said, make it and let's all sleep on it. We loved it. Gore-Tex bed sheet on a water bed with four beers in you. Whoa, it was like surfing. <laughs> so I went to AI DuPont Hospital in Wilmington, Delaware, put the sheet on the bed got some patients on it, and within one day we found out why you have never seen that bed sheet in a hospital again. The orderly came to do sponge bath, and see, I had failed physics, and it was called low coefficient of friction. You know, <laughs> there they go. The, pa <laughs> the patient, catheters, slid right off the bed. <laughs> Bill Gore didn't let me stop with a failure.